Welcome to episode five of Pod for Good. I am your chief philanthropod, Jesse Orich. And I am your vice admiral philanthropod, Chris Miller. And on our inaugural holiday episode, we give thanks for art with AHA's director of education and exhibitions, Dr. Amber Litwack. Today we'll talk about AHA's upcoming exhibition, Experience 2, Experience Harder. No, it's real name. No, it's not. We'll also talk about the importance of arts in education, all the things that make up art, and how AHA tries to make it accessible for all. Remember to rate and subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. There are many places now. Please email us at pods the number four good at gmail.com with feedback or suggestions for future guests. And I hope you enjoy our conversation with Amber. It was a lot of fun. Enjoy. Thank you, Dr. Amber Litwack for joining us today. Happy to be here. So why don't you tell us about AHA? All right. Is there anything specific you want to know? Well, I'm curious if, I, if I'm pronouncing it with the right emphasis. Is it aha or is it aha? It is whichever way you okay. like for it to be. I like that. So, formerly the Arts and Humanities Council of Tulsa, aha's current mission is to cultivate a more creative Tulsa through education, advocacy, and innovative partnerships. We carry out our mission through school and community programs and through partnerships both on-site at AHA Tulsa, which the physical location is a 40,000 square foot visual arts center, and in area schools and in the community, as well as through exhibitions and professional development opportunities for artists. We also have um, a council affiliate program with a membership of nearly 100 local arts and cultural organizations that is designed to strengthen the arts and humanities sector through partnerships, shared services, and advocacy. That is a lot of things. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so you mentioned the uh, exhibitions and yes. your title is director of education and exhibitions. Correct. So can you tell us about some of the exhibitions that you do? Any particularly interesting ones or maybe ones that are a little different? Sure. So there um, currently we have up what we call the experience, which is a large scale immersive arts environment that was created by five local Tulsa artists. This version of the experience will be up through December 29th of this year. We're actually going to tear all of that out and start over um, and reinstall a new version called the Experience Imagine, this time with six local Tulsa artists. Um, and it's going to provide, it's going to really level things up. It's going to provide a completely new opportunity for Tulsans or anyone visiting the Tulsa community to experience immersive art. Was there a discussion about whether to call it the Experience 2.0? <laughs> you know, honestly, that was never formally on the table, but that was a working title okay. for, for some time. Experience to experience harder. Yes. Experience harder. That's that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's pretty intense and I've only seen the entrance of it. I'm just like, whoa, there's a big eyeball just staring right at me. There is. So I know in your background that you've studied education and you've studied art history and art in general. I have. And so my, my question to people who study art and who also study education is how do you explain how important art education is? You know, drawing on my background, I have a PhD in, in educational research from Oklahoma State University. And I really spent a lot of my time in school digging in really rigorously to all of the existing research on the value of arts and education. And there are so many studies. There's a huge growing body of literature that points to the numerous benefits of the arts, both in school and a community setting. And so there, there are so many, there are so many numerous benefits, but students exposed to the arts show greater academic achievement, higher test scores, are able to collaborate easier with their peers, have better critical thinking skills, have better creative thinking skills. And the list really goes on and on. If you look at a struggling school that adopts an arts integration model of school reform, the benefits are in 
credible. I don't know why we aren't doing this more across the United States. So you and I first met in in partnership on the Any Given Child program. We did. Do you want to give a quick summary of what that is? Sure, I'd be happy to. So the Any Given Child program is a national initiative of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in D.C. that helps communities develop a plan for a quality sequential arts education that serves every student in a school district. In our case, our partner school district is Tulsa Public Schools in grades K through 8. The program looks different community to community, but the way that the program is structured in Tulsa is that each grade level has a designated art partner where they receive at least one arts-related or a live arts experience or arts-related field trip per year, as well as arts curriculum in their classroom and teacher professional development. Did uh, I cover everything? Yeah, I n- was never able to remember all different eight, I guess, nine trips. Yes. Okay, so let me outline all of yes. them. So kindergarten, the kiddos um, see a, an age-appropriate theater performance provided by the PAC Trust and Tulsa Library. The first grade students visit Gilchrist Museum. Second grade is a children's opera courtesy of Tulsa Opera. Third grade is Philbrook Museum. Fourth grade is Chamber Music Tulsa and Tulsa Symphony Orchestra, so they get two experiences. Fifth grade is Tulsa Ballet. Sixth grade is AHA Tulsa and either Living Arts of Tulsa, 108 Contemporary, or Philbrook Downtown. Seventh grade is Corgus Productions, um, who provides a modern dance performance. And then eighth grade is the Sherwin Miller Museum of Jewish Art. And we, we can now give a shout out to the um, current AHA employee who helps manage that, Alex Kitchens, who is great and has to deal with so much logistics. Like She does. It is, as someone who's on the sort of receiving end of these tours, it amazed me like how much goes into this. There's so many buses, there's so much scheduling that goes on. Mm-hmm. And the the I can count on one hand how many times something got messed up and it was always usually charter school related. <laughs> so I'm not gonna comment. No comments. But, yeah. You don't need to comment on that. But I will say yes, Alex is incredible. Um she just does a wonderful job. She's so committed to her job and she is probably the most organized person I know. And she's really able to um, keep people in line in a really kind way. So she definitely has the perfect skill set for her job. Can you tell me about the Project Zero Fellowship that you did at the Harvard Graduate School of Education? Sure. So this was a fellowship as part of my doctoral program. Okay, first let me give you a little bit of background on Project Zero. So Project Zero is a an initiative of the Harvard Graduate School of Education that its main focus is to study arts education and creativity in schools. And so um, it's called Project Zero because at the time this this research started, um, there really was zero, almost zero research in that field. And so they have contributed an enormous amount of um, research and scholarship to frame the importance of the arts being part of school day every single day, honestly. But they have a couple of programs, and and the one that I, uh, that my fellowship centered around is making thinking visible. And so they have very um, specific strategies, some of them focused on works of art, and some of them that are actually broadly applicable to other disciplines that really allow students to be able to make their thinking visible. So there's a lot, of course, it's really focused on metacognition and students being aware of why they have the thoughts that they do about whether it be a particular work of art or, you know, whatever it is that they're studying. Um, It's really applicable. They have lots of different, what they call thinking routines. Um, Just to give you an example. So there's one that could be used with a work of art or a media image called See, Think, Wonder. And it's a really basic routine where students discuss, you know, as a group, what they're seeing, what they think about what they're seeing, and then what questions they still have. So there's lots of those nifty thinking routines, and that's really what my time there uh, focused on. So there's been a lot of studies and research showing that 
critical thinking has um, not developed as well in especially millennials and Gen Z. And that seems to coincide uh, along with uh, when arts began to be de-emphasized in schools. Has your research shown that there's a connection there? I mean, yes, absolutely. There's also a lot of research, and this is something else that I have a lot of interest in. There's a lot of research showing how, you know, the just frequent use of technology rewires a student's brain, or not a student, a, a young person, anyone who is just constantly on their phone, and the way that they receive and process information as a result is is very, very different. You know, in some cases, this has been shown to actually diminish creative creativity and critical thinking. So that's something else that's happening at the same time. I believe that everyone is born creative, and I, I really believe that the way that our current educational system is set up um, really pounds the creativity out of children. And it's really unfortunate if they don't have any time to explore or experiment, if they're just forced to continually um, these skill and drill, you know, lessons to perform well on serialized tests, you know, that really that changes their brain structure and they, they lose the ability to learn how to do things like experiment and use their imagination, etc. So that's why I think it's so important that students have regular, consistent exposure to the arts, and then it's done in a way where they are able to build these skills. Like one thing that we know, looking at the research, so it's not completely just abysmal, is that creativity is a skill that can be learned. And so the more time people spend, you know, Flexing those creative muscles, the stronger they become and the more creative a person becomes. So we're seeing with, uh, unfortunately, what we're seeing with uh, at TU, mm. that they're looking at focusing on what they are seem to be saying, creating university that's preparing people for the job market. Do you see the with their design of cutting certain artistic and humanities type programs potentially counterproductive for preparing people for the workforce? Unfortunately, yes. I mean, I, I do. I agree with that very much. I am one of the many who believe that that is not the way to go. I understand their thinking. I do. I understand that it's challenging financially to have small academic programs, especially at the graduate level. But there really aren't in Tulsa, there aren't any other graduate level, you know, art programs and so I think that our community is going to suffer as a result instead of now being able to find the best interns in the grad school at TU. I have no idea where I'm going to get my interns. But no, I, in all seriousness, I do think that that is going to be, you know, something that's that's detrimental. So this is a I'm going to take a conversation in a slightly different direction for now just to have some little fun. So as someone who has studied lots of art, do you have like an artistic pet peeve, like some like a, a movement or a style that just you don't get or that you don't like? <laughs> oh, wow. Let me I'm going to have to think about this. Are you thinking about that? Uh, while you're thinking about that, let me rant about the thing, uh, the art thing that bothers me the most. And Chris, I th <laughs> and Chris knows what this is. I feel like he only asked this question because he wanted to be able to rant. I about this. just want someone to agree with me that uh, orange and tan is not a real painting. <laughs> It was in our 11th grade English class. I think so. Yes, oh my gosh. just a stripe of orange and a stripe of tan. And I was like, that's not art. That's two colors. Anyway. Did it make you feel something? Yeah. Anger. And ah, hatred. Then it worked. Then it worked. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I thought for sure you'd go with the sad trombone. I was going to do that during the TU part. It, was, it was, <laughs> wasn't a right moment for it. <laughs> I mean, so like uh, another example is. Um, while I was living in Boston, they had a, you know, a, uh, a contemporary art museum. And mm -hmm. we went once to an exhibit that was about shapes, right? Mm -hmm. So it was lots of large pieces, like in concave and whatever the other of concave is. Whatever convex? The convex? Convex, yes. Shaped items and whatnot. And I remember staring at it and I'm like, this required a lot of work. I feel nothing. Mm -hmm. I could see how difficult it was to make. And I think I saw what the artist was trying to get me to see, but I didn't feel anything. And that's okay. Like I, not every artistic piece has to affect me, but mm -hmm. people were, you know, like sort of ooing and awing and deep thinking. And I was just like, I, 
It's just, it's, it wasn't happening to, happening to me. So I, I'm always curious about people who spend their time in art just being like, all right, I have to talk about this thing that doesn't do anything for me, but this is part of the <laughs> curriculum sure. we do or anything like that. Yeah. Well, that's, um, you know, different people resonate with different things and that's okay. But one thing that you did get was, you know, you could appreciate the amount of time and the amount of effort that it took to construct that piece. One of the reasons that I love art so much and I'm so passionate about art is I'm really just interested in someone's creative process, the why beyond behind, like why they're making whatever it is that they're making. And so if you look at things with that mindset, you know, you can learn to appreciate almost anything, whether or not it's something that you have like a visceral reaction to. But back to your earlier question Mm. about, I will say I've seen a lot of bad performance art. Mm, Yeah. (laughs) So I'm just going to leave that there. I've also seen some really incredible performance art, but there is a lot of bad performance art that I will say um, just made me really angry or frustrated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was, um, so yeah, I've seen some Boston ballet pieces when they would, after their, after their shows of normal ballets, they would do like a modern like compilation. And there were some pieces where I was like, I don't understand what, what's happening right now. It, there was one point and someone else, in this, someone else in this house who I will not mention will agree with me. It looked like the, per- the people were just itching themselves. And I was just <laughs> like, I, what, why? But was it inspired by, Bed bugs or I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like dance, there- like dance has always been one of those things where I'm like, wow, like a person's very athletic, but I don't know what I'm supposed to be feeling right now. But see if there's not like the music's also trying to sort of not distract, but overwhelm you. I feel like a lot of like, the modern dance pieces I've seen have had very like loud, like intense music. Mm-hmm. And that sort of like almost distracts me from what I'm supposed to be watching. Well, and um, I've seen a lot of uh, documentaries about performance art. Some of them honestly seem like they're a parody of themselves, which I wonder if that's what they're going for. But Meta. Mm-hmm. would you ever see AHA doing like a true performance art type, the kind where it's like it's going for 12 hours a day, somebody there, you know, sitting at a chair yelling at people or whatever. Interesting. Never say never. But I would try <laughs> to. I think that that would be a long discussion with our exhibition committee. Uh-huh. And we would be fully prepared to articulate the merit of okay. what it was that we were presenting. There you go. Well, the yeah, there was a I think I think it was in Chicago uh, performance arts piece where this woman just smiled at you. And you could sit there as long as you want. And she would just smile at you. And it apparently it was very moving because like mm-hmm. people would relax and. You know, and at first I, I, I mocked it as because like, I'm a sarcastic person. But then I thought about it. I'm like, we don't just stare at someone's face, mm-hmm. a happy face for that long, that often anymore. And so. Well, and how many people who went to that went the whole day without a single person smiling? That's yeah. true. Yeah. You know, so it could be really impactful to people. I yeah. don't disagree. Yeah. In artistic communities, what is the kind of art that other artists make fun of? Is it performance <laughs> art? <laughs> Um, if you don't want to say, I'll just play a sound effect instead. All right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so one thing I do appreciate about AHA is it does seem like with a lot of the exhibitions, there the, the story is there. A lot of museums I go to, maybe you get a little bit of blurb about the artist, but it's not a story about the artwork itself. So is that intentional? You mentioned you like the story. Is that intentional? It is. It is very intentional. It's really important to me that whatever we present, we provide solid interpretive materials to really mm-hmm. help the public connect with what it is that we're presenting. Well, and some of them have been, you know, controversial, whether whether it's the subject matter, mm-hmm. the way it's depicted, or often it seems what the public ex- assumes it's about. And I think sometimes the story helps with that. Correct. Absolutely. And yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed, and I think this goes to Chris's the previous question, that the sort of art that AHA exhibits for people to come when they come to your very large space are usually more like challenging to people's standard idea of what art is. And I appreciate that. But I, I'm I'm also curious about what is when you're in conversations with people it's about art in general, how do you get them sort of out of their comfort zones of the art that what would normally be called art to them in the small amount of art education we've all received? 
Well, um, it, first of all, it depends on the audience. You know, we really try to provide tours and support um, and custom tailor those things to the audience that's coming in. So we'll ask a lot of questions beforehand to learn as much as we can about that group so that we can really meet them where they are. Going back to the interpretive materials we provide, you know, we really try to use a tone that is not overly academic, that's very approachable, um, and translate things into terms that most anyone could understand. People have expectations and you sort of tailor how you're explaining it to that group sort of level of of, of, of background knowledge. That's correct. And then when we are giving tours to both school groups and adult groups, we often will use a lot of questions and a lot of questioning strategies going back to the Project Zero thinking routines. Um, we also will sometimes use another method that helps people engage deeply with what they're seeing. It's called visual thinking strategies. So that really allow people to have a deeper experience with that one painting or object, whatever it may be that they're exploring. Do you have a favorite kind of art? Like personally, because before you mentioned performance art, I realized I was mostly just thinking visual and that's, that's only one kind of art. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I, most of my background is primarily visual arts. And so yes, that, and I do, I really am drawn to a lot of, um, contemporary art. That's really where my passion is. It's what gets me really excited. So. so when you say contemporary art, what do you mean? I mean, Art since 1945. Okay. so we, Modern like, and contemporary. Okay. Contemporary is generally the artist is still living, um, which there are a lot of living artists that I, you know, I'm just absolutely obsessed with their work and their process and the fact that they're living and I might get to someday engage with them and ask them questions about their work is very exciting. And are they, are they visual artists are they poets are they yes everyone that i'm just thinking of is a visual artist right now because like i was thinking about music as as an art form and how like absolutely like we call like literally like musicians are called artists but you don't like mm -hmm. i separate them in my mind and i shouldn't because creating music is just another form of art it's true so so who are some of your favorite artists oh my gosh that is name drop such a hard question <laughs> it really is a hard question um, I've been really into, I've been thinking a lot about, um, I've been looking at a lot of, of contemporary African American artists and I really uh, am inspired by the work of Kara Walker. She does a lot of large scale cut paper silhouettes. Um, Nick Cave who makes these incredible sound suits, the Esther Gates, um, he does. He just creates some incredible work that is typically installation based. Um, there are so many. Like there are so many. Like I could say her for the rest of the day. But if anyone has not heard of those folks, I urge you to look them up and read about what they do because it's all really fascinating. So it, it seems like um, that the experience, and we've seen a lot of uh, some similar exhibitions that are sort of at least loosely inspired by Meow Wolf. Is that where you kind of got your inspiration for it? Or is it just you wanted to do something a little bit more experiential with art? You know, I think it really, I think anyone who is creating this type of work and who doesn't say that they are in some way inspired by Meow Wolf is lying. They really were the trailblazers. And this has started, this will be like the movement of this time. There are so many different things popping up around the world, whether it be, you know, something like Kusama's Infinity Room that was just acquired by Crystal Bridges or any of the number of immersive, experiential, large-scale installations that are happening across the U.S., I think that most of those things really have their roots in Meow Wolf. Can you describe Meow Wolf for people, our listeners who haven't ever heard of it? Yeah, sure. okay. Podcasting is a visual medium, as we've, as we've <laughs> discussed. So, um, Meow Wolf is 
a very large scale immersive environment that their first location is in an old bowling alley in Santa Fe, New Mexico. They, gosh, hundreds of artists contributed to the vision of what they were trying to create. Prior to creating this permanent exhibition called House of Eternal Return, that's the title, it's super fascinating when you go in, um, the first thing you see is the facade of a fairly normal looking like Victorian style house. Then when you enter that house, you notice that there's something different about it. And so there are all of these different paths that you can take. There's no set path. You start exploring. You realize that you can, you know, that the refrigerators are portals to a different world. Or you can climb through the fireplace into yet another completely different world. They also ha- There's also a storyline about the family who lived in this house Um, I don't want to give anything away, but it's super fascinating. And so if that's your thing, you can try to decipher all of these clues and codes. That is not an element that we have included um, as part of the experience, but it's something super fascinating. I will be honest, when I went to Meow Wolf, I didn't engage with that at all. I was so just blown away by all of the visual and audio stimulation and all of the things that you can climb on or touch And I felt like I've only been there once and I thought I had seen everything. You know, we spent a good day there. And then I realized talking with people afterwards that, you know, there were some things I didn't see. So I obviously need to go back. Um, But it's again, it's something I would highly recommend. It's pretty fascinating. Well, you you also mentioned uh, Crystal Bridges, which for those who don't know, it's a wonderful museum in northwest Arkansas. But it seems like they also tried to make art a little bit more accessible with what they do in some of their trail system and stuff like that. Yeah, do you see for some sure. similarities between what AHA does and what Crystal Bridges tries to do? Yeah, for sure. Some of the programming, I mean, I think there are similarities. I think that, you know, we are trying to reach a similar demographic. It makes sense. They, of course, are a collecting institution. They have a really pretty incredible collection. We are not. That's one common misconception about AHA. We just show traveling exhibitions. We don't have any type of, of permanent collection. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Are there Most any, people don't. Most are there any other assume. misconceptions about AHA that, that you run into? I don't know if it's misconceptions so much as... It's we've really worked the past couple of years on our branding. When we opened our new facility, the organization had had been around already for 50 plus years. We used to office out of um, Har Walden Mansion, which is an historic mansion off 21st and Riverside in Tulsa. And we didn't really have a space that was appropriate to bring people in and do on-site programming. So everything that we did was community-based. So when we opened AHA back in 2011, we built the building from scratch, but it was very, our identity became very complicated and very confusing. And so we've been really trying to streamline our branding so that people um, understand that we are the same organization, essentially, with a different name, and that our mission now has broadened since that we now that we have a space that we can actually let the public come in and see exhibitions and create our own site and etc. And that it is aha uh-huh, all lower caps. It is that <laughs> was that is part of our new branding. Um, we have a new logo. Um, yes, so that is all that has all changed, and hopefully will stick for a while. You mentioned Har Weldon and our listeners expect us to ask the tough questions. So I have to ask, are we ever getting a Har Weldon murder mystery or or just a aha murder mystery dinner again, even if it's not at Har Weldon? Yeah. Please say yes. I know. It was honestly one of my favorite things as we, well. We won the costume contest we one did. year. We did. Which year was that? That was the superhero mm-hmm. themed uh, one. That was a good one. And uh, we also won the murder mystery one year. You Good job. Yeah. So I think that was the same year because I've, yeah, okay. I've only been once. Yes, because I've only been once and then it ended. So we did both. Yeah. It was probably that year then. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, no. like, congrats. That was amazing. Yes. We, we, we had literally just moved back to Tulsa like three weeks previously. Yeah. That's like the first thing we did. Oh, good. Yeah. Yes. Well, so. yes. So probably not at Harwelden. Yeah. Um, they have, if you haven't been there, check it out. They have done some really extensive renovations oh. and the new owner has really big plans for that space. So I don't know that it would be feasible to do it there. We've talked about it. I don't know that it has really the right environment. Yeah, if only there were some people with really large houses who could op- <laughs> right? open up those houses for a <laughs> fundraiser for AHA or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. You, you never know. But that is not an immediate plan right now. Sorry, everyone. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no one's more disappointed than I am. I was going to ask, what is what is a typical day for you look like? Mm, gosh, you know, there's not a typical day for me. My job, that's one of the things I really love about my job is that it can vary so much from day to day. I oversee all of our on-site programming, our community programming, and then our exhibitions. And so it's just, in any given day, I could go from working on curating a show to going to meet with a community partner about a new idea or program to, um, you know, cleaning up a leak on the third floor to writing a grant for something like it's just things are truly all over the place. There is no typical day. So what's it like um, interacting with artists, especially when they're in the middle of their creative process, like with uh, the experience? It's usually great. Um, Artists, just like all people, have their quirks (laughs) and their, you know, preferences and, you know, for the most part, it's great. <laughs> I like, I appreciate the pauses. Yes, yeah, so that, 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 that was a very pregnant pause and I appreciate it. So your office at AHA has a very, very long window that is easy for passersby to look in on you. Is that almost sort of like AHA wanted to do sort of a live exhibit and you are the exhibit? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wouldn't the joke be on me if that was the case? No. I they kinda, are doing performance art. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of feels that way sometimes. You know, I have, I love having on the light. I love being able to have all the plants in my office. But yeah, people do walk by and, you know, our building currently, I don't know how clear it is what our building actually is. And so we have this large, rusty building, very modern, that's made out of steel. And, you know, people are constantly either walking by, peering in the window, and I just kind of wave at them or ignore them, depending on what I'm doing. Or they just smack the building, (laughs) which at first was really unsettling. But I think people are just not sure where the material is. And so they just feel the need to kind of pound on it. Instead of just like touching it? No, it's always a loud like. Who does that? Like, I I wonder what this is. Yeah, I'm going to hit it as hard as I can. Lots of people. Wow. So many people. I'm amazed you and I haven't done that. This is why we need more arts in schools. (laughs) Right? What is this? Hit it as hard as I can. (laughs) That happens at least once a day. Wow. So uh, I, you also have a lot of uh, educational programs, host classes. Jesse even did a podcast class there. So it seems, like, it seems like you um, also, AHA, is sort of a space for creatives beyond the exhibitions. Yes, absolutely. So the third floor of our building has been converted into what we call this studio, but it's a fine arts focused maker space. Where anyone who comes in, once you pay admission, you can go up to the third floor and spend as long as you'd like creating and experimenting. We have lots of different materials that change on a regular basis. For people who have trouble getting started, we have a vintage pinball machine full of creative challenges. Did, did not if see that. Needs needs an idea. Um, those are always available. Sometimes we'll have different. Uh, activities or what we call invitations to create or experiment set up, which might be something like plastic fusing with recycled plastic bags, or um, we try to do things that most people likely haven't experienced to really get them in that, wow, I didn't know you could do this, that creative frame of mind. So surrounding that center space, we also have four creative labs, our first creative lab, and these are our spaces where we hold classes and workshops 
is focused on printmaking and fibers. The second is primarily sculpture and metals. Then we have a dark room that is a traditional black and white dark room, a lighting studio and a finishing room, all for traditional photography or digital. You can use whatever you'd like to shoot in the lighting studio. And then we also have a computer lab, um, a Mac lab, and that's where we teach classes in digital media, like podcasting and Photoshop and, you know, all of those fun things. So do you see that space specifically for artists or for anybody who wants to? anyone. It's really for anyone. Our primary demographic, while we certainly offer some more advanced level classes and workshops that are very much geared toward professional artists. The bulk of what we do is geared towards a hobbyist or someone who is just starting out. Those are typically the most successful classes that we offer. Another benefit that we offer artists um, who have experience in any given media, they can come in. They It's what we call scheduled access. They can schedule a time to work in one of our creative labs for an hourly fee. So that, um, you know, we really want to provide as much access as we can to those spaces. So anytime there's not a formal class or workshop scheduled, um, they just have to fill out a simple online form and can schedule their time. It's a really super good deal, and we get quite a lot of use out of that. So that's really how we're primarily serving our professional artists mm-hmm. in the community. But otherwise, it's really for anyone and everyone. So other than the Experience 2.0, because I can't remember what its actual name was. Experience 2, Experience Harder. Yes, Experience 2, Experience Harder. That's it. It's the new title. Yes. Changing all the marketing Listen, it's the best title. (laughs) What else can... um, Was it Experience Imagine? It is. it is. That is the the current name. I don't remember. Experience Imagine. So Experience Imagine, parentheses 2, Imagine Harder. Now I can't remember what it was. Now it's Imagine Harder? Yeah, Imagine Harder. (laughs) Experience Boogaloo? Yeah. Sure. What else does AHA have coming up that you would want people to know about? Oh my gosh. We have one thing that's coming up next month that I'm really excited about. On December 7th from 12 to 5 is our AHA holiday event. So it's a really inclusive holiday event, not just focused on... Christmas. We'll have lots of things that bring in other cultural traditions as well. We will, however, have, you know, everyone has a human Santa Claus. So we decided that we wanted to do something a little bit different. So we are going to have a celebrity pig. (gasps) Kevin Bacon Pig will be there um, for a meet and treat. So he will be dressed as either an elf or Santa Claus. Get to feed him some cookies, attempt to take photos. <laughs> Can't promise how well those will turn out. But we'll have lots of fun activities for the entire family. Um, it's going to be a really good time. We have a new exhibition opening up next first Friday called Creative Cabal. And this is um, an exhibition that focuses on a group of Tulsa artists who have gotten together to share their work and and discuss their work for over 15 years. And so you'll see some of Tulsa's best known artists and some of Tulsa's best kept secrets in this exhibition. So it's going to be, it's going to be really great too. That sounds really cool. You mentioned first Friday, first Friday has evolved quite a bit over the last when, when, when did First Friday start? Has oh my it been gosh, 10 years? it's been more, than 10, more years. than 10 years. Yes, it's been going on since really before the Arts District was the Arts District. Yes. So um, when there were just a handful of, of tiny galleries and just a really small attendance, but it has grown you know, exponentially with all of the new development downtown and all of the new museums and galleries. Yes. <laughs> Do you ever miss the smaller, just little gallery, intimate version of First Friday versus the now huge version that it is today? I have a love-hate relationship (laughs) with First Friday. I mean, I love that people come out who, you know, often are not your traditional gallery and museum goers, and they come and they, 
you know, explore and that's amazing. But, you know, it's so there's so many people who attend First Friday and it's great, but it's also like can be super overwhelming, kind of a logistical nightmare. Um, <laughs> so and if you need a, a break during First Friday, if you're a member of AHA, there's a space that you can hang out in to get a little. A there little. is. We do have um, one of our membership benefits is the members lounge. So every first Friday we have some really good snacks. We have the good cheese from Whole Foods and wine and beer. So that's a great perk. And, you know, an individual membership is only $75 a year and you can have 12 months of all the wine and cheese you can consume on first Fridays. So it's a it's a pretty good deal. What else do you get with membership? Oh my gosh, you get there's there are lots of different perks. Um, free admission all year round for yourself and a guest if you have the individual membership. Discounts on classes and workshops. Discount in our gift shop. We have some really um, really cool items. Some really cool locally made items. Um, the member lounge, which is a huge benefit. Those are kind of the main. There are probably some others, but those are the ones that people are most excited about. I can tell you, yeah. I think in, in 12 First Fridays, I can drink $75 worth of wine. You must oh, definitely, definitely can. <laughs> most definitely. I also want to give a, a shout out to that helicopter that flew by as she was answering that, because the listeners are going to hear it. I just want them to know. I heard it too. <laughs> I didn't even notice. Oh. So that's... Yeah, I was focusing on our guests. Well, I was too um, until so. the helicopter. <laughs> so as someone who appreciates art, like you said, you have a love-hate relationship with First Friday. You don't really get to enjoy it because you're because AHA is open and you are usually there. I'm always there. Yes. Welcoming right. guests and, and being very friendly when I, when I know you want to be out looking at the things. That's, you know, honestly, the times that if there's something I really want to see, which is honestly almost every week, I try to sneak off and go and take a peek. But the thing about First Friday is it's so packed, it's hard to really enjoy the art. And so also it's Tulsa, Smalsa, so you can't walk five feet without seeing someone you know. <laughs> so that makes it, which is great. You know, I love, you know, seeing people and seeing them excited about the arts in Tulsa. But if I just, you know, have this mission to go and see whatever it is, that can slow things down a little bit. No, I mean, I think it's a great idea because like some of the museums are sort of only open during business hours. And so this, there's not necessarily a, a good time for someone who works a nine to five job to be able to go to these museums. No, you're right. And that's something um, when we started looking at what we were offering, you know, we changed our hours. So we're now open Wednesday through Saturday, 12 to 9, and Sunday, 12 to 7, to be more accessible to the general population. You know, the vast majority of people are either at work or school during the day, and so we really wanted to provide that accessibility. That's really important. Should we slide into our last activity that we do? Well, I was just going to ask, I mean, you mentioned that um, you, people can help out via the membership, what, yes. are, what are other ways people can help out with AHA, either donating, volunteering, programs, we'll, anything? We love unsolicited donations. <laughs> we will never turn those away. We also are always looking for volunteers for some of our bigger events, um, our annual gala that is happening on May 9th. We always need volunteers for that, and it's a pretty good deal because you get to attend for free. Um, we have another event coming up in April, our that's Tinkerfest. It's, it's, we, our first Tinkerfest was last year and it is a celebration of art, culture, and making. And so we activate our entire building. We need lots and lots of volunteers for that. So, you know, anyone who gets, wants to get involved, of course, um, we have lots of committees, uh, board committees. However, most of the committees, you do not have to be a board member to serve on those committees. So we love to have really diverse representation from our community. Um, so yeah, tons of ways to get involved. When you said uh, you activate your entire building, I almost like imagine the building like standing up on like robotic <laughs> legs and moving. But, yeah. Which would be pretty awesome. That's what we just do. Yes. That's exactly what it is. Yes. Exactly That's what actually experience. Imagine you just spoiled it. Okay. 
You mean, you mean experience 2.0? Yeah. All right. <laughs> experience harder? <laughs> experience harder. That, that's it. So if yeah, somebody so. wants to help out, how how should they yeah, contact? Yeah, they can either contact me or Alex Kitchens. Um, we last, the last member of our, of the A-team, our program and exhibitions team, her last day was Friday. Oh. So for now, it's Alex and I, but I can always be reached via email at A-L-I-T-W-A-C-K at ahatulsa.org. Or Alex can be reached at a k i t c h e n s Alex Kitchens at ahatulsa dot org. The first time I saw an email from Alex, I'm like, they can't be her real last name. It is, Which, but it is, but it is. <laughs> so the way we like to end every podcast is to have our guest pick something from our Nerd Cave Studio that either calls to them or that confuses them so that they want it explained to them by us. Oh, I like this. So there are many things. Take take your time. Hmm. Okay, I have to walk around. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. First one who's picked him. Yes. Yes. So what you picked was the Funko Pop of Groot from Guardians of the Galaxy, who is a large walking tree mm-hmm. who whose entire language is just uh, three words, which is "I am Groot." Technically, we are Groot at one point. He mm-hmm. says, uh, but yeah, he is a, a sentient tree. He's, so which version is this? This is, I think, adult Groot. So this is adult Groot. Yes. Okay. Uh, spoiler alert, at the end of Guardians of the Galaxy, he sort of sacrifices himself, but is sort of reincarnated as a twig. And so then in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, you have baby Groot, which is definitely the most adorable Groot. So he's a little tree. And as he gets older, he starts to get saucy like a teenager would. So it's very funny. And uh, you definitely check out the film. He's great. I'm into him. He's voiced by uh, Vin, Vin Diesel. Diesel. Yes. Who interesting thing about that? Even the uh, all the foreign language dubs, he wanted to do them himself. So he actually did all of the dubs in all of the different languages. So he said, "I am Groot in like a hundred languages." Oh, that's amazing! Yeah. So shout out to Vin Diesel. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so you you picked out the Funko Pop of Groot, which uh, is delightful. Uh, we have the one where at the end of the movie, when he's small, he does a little dance at the end. And I have that somewhere. I th- actually, I think I gave it as a gift because uh, someone wanted it so badly. But yes. yeah, Groot, he's he's great. Yes. Groot's great. He's cute. There are many. There are plush dolls. There mm-hmm. are uh, dancing flower pots of Groot. Um, it is great. He's so. my new, my new buddy. All right. Yeah. Well, we, we will take a picture of you with him very soon so th- yes. thank you so much My lucky day. Yes. yes thank, thank you so you. much for joining us doctor <laughs> doctor doctor <laughs> thank you both for having me it's <laughs> great thank you all for listening i hope you really enjoyed our conversation with amber and all the amazing work aha does and our our fun tangents about what kind of art we like again you can find us on apple Podcasts, google play stitcher tune in all the different places where podcasts are available Please like our page on Facebook, which is Podcast for Good, spelled normally. And please send us any feedback you might have at pods for good, the number four, at gmail.com. Thank you all for listening and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Get it done, Telsa. Please like our Facebook page, which is Pod for Good. I think I should look that up. Our Facebook page. Ugh, I'm just gonna do this all over again.